message actually is going to be. Because usually when we look at this message and talk about Jesus' arrest and the betrayal, it seems like this is the point where Jesus loses control. He becomes, and you know, the other, the, he says, you know, basically darkness, it's your time to reign. And there's just this sense that there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, like Jesus loses control of the situation. But when you read all of the events, is what we're going to do today, and you put them all together, there is not a single event, not a single moment, even during this time, that Jesus isn't in perfect, total control of the circumstance and situation. It wasn't out of his hands. It was completely in his hands, even as he went through this time where it seems like he's not. And so this is kind of, I want just to prepare your mind for this. So we're going to look at Jesus in a new light from this. But before we do, I do want to pray a couple of small things. First and foremost, uh, here's the facts and situation. COVID numbers are actually back up to almost December levels. So if you look at the number of new cases in Greene County, it's back up to December right before the peak. All right. And so... Um, if you have not had your shot and, and vaccination, be careful. All right, it's, it's this time that you really need to recognize that the number of cases are, are coming up to the same place where it was. And so I just encourage you, be care, careful. If you, you know, when you see people wear masks, smile. You know, I, I, there was a time basically in, let's say, May when the you know, COVID cases were near nil. I was looking at people going, come on, it's time to let this go. But now is the time that, you know, it's good reason that they would probably, you know, to wear their mask in the grocery store. So once again, keep, make sure the smiles. <laughs> all right, we're going through this time again where COVID's causing all kinds of tension. We need to smile and love one another and, and be, you know, extend that grace to one another. So I just want to make, you know, acknowledge the fact and be praying. Be praying I blink that pesky virus keeps popping back up. But you know the thing is? America still hasn't listened to God. So who knows how long this is going to go on until God says, are you ever going to listen to me? Are you ever actually going to turn back to me? Are you actually going to seek me <coughs> as a nation? I don't know. We'll see what happens. New York's going through turmoil, and now God says, here, how about I give you a hurricane too? I mean, he, God's saying, wake up. He is saying, wake up. He has given us plenty of warnings. The problem is, is, you know, those who do know God have kind of listened already. Those who don't know him just continue to say, yeah, whatever. It's a coincidence, and they blame everything else but getting God's attention, all right? So um, we're in a world right now that's a lot of conflict, a lot of tension, a lot of pain. It's lifting up Haiti. It's lifting up Afghanistan. But those aren't just the only places. Those are the big names in the news. There's, you know, Nigeria still has turmoil and Christians being persecuted in that country. Jesus is getting, he's ready to come back. And the world's just reflecting the need for that. So, but just keep in prayer. Lift those things up. As you read the headlines, don't panic, pray. Don't panic, pray. Bring God into that, all right? And uh, be praying for all of those who are being affected with COVID and getting sick right now, because there's a good number of people. There's a, there's a lot of active cases. And uh, because of COVID fatigue, you know, I think I, we, we're tired of that, but we can't be fatigued. We must... I continue to pray, lift, and 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 love. All right, um, public service announcement <laughs> for Pastor Rick today. All right, <clears throat> excuse me, I need the water. So I was. This is an amazing story. I forgot to print out the sheet because I what I did here, again, just kind of like we did with the um, uh, Jesus in the Garden, where I made the sheet that had all the gospel narratives. Well, I did the same thing for the arrest. Because every single one of the Gospels records the narrative of what happened at that time. However, each one of them kind of focuses in on a unique place. And so this whole last couple of weeks, I've been trying to synthesize. And, you know, okay, so how did this happen? What was actually said? Just really digging into this. <clears throat> and for you, if you want to <laughs> jump back and forth, Matthew 26. Matthew 26, the end of that, uh, it, 47 through 56, uh, records it in Matthew. Uh, the other, Mark 14, at the end of Mark 14. Uh, the end of Luke 22. Okay, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I really wish I would print this thing out. Luke 22, and the last one is in John 18. And so, you know, Mark, Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18, 
uh, record what happens, what we're going to talk about here, <clears throat> about Jesus' betrayal by Judas and the arrest. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Bryson. So, here's the 30,000-foot review. First and foremost, this is one of those topics where nobody, every one of the Gospels records what happened at this particular event. But each one documents it in a unique, unique way. It doesn't mean that they have different points. It's just that uh, Matthew kind of focused in on a little bit more about the interchange between Judas and Jesus. There's a little bit more depth in his and what he recorded about what they talked about there. Whereas Mark, he kind of focuses on a little bit of a different area where he talks about, <laughs> you know, the desertion and, you know, kind of, I didn't even put this in my point about, you know, John Mark uh, running away naked, <laughs> most likely. Uh, the, the, the author of Mark was the guy who was there who he only had his shirt on and got that ripped off him, so he fled the scene naked. You know, that was kind of a, <laughs> you know the Bible is written by real people, when Mark would kind of even refer reference to himself going, yeah, this, this dumb kid who was only wearing a night shirt that got ripped off and he fled. And, but, you know, Mark captures a different point. Luke focuses in on, uh, you know, the, about the fight and the sword and, and a little bit about that aspect. And John is all about the authority of Jesus. Uh, and he kind of talks about, you know, when, when they come looking for Jesus and his announcement. And so each one of them have a really, you know, they go, all right, this is what I remember from this event. This is what I remember was passed on to me. You know, somebody told me this story, and I, you know, I recorded it this way. And, it, and it's nice because there's nothing contradictory, but it just builds depth. And what I want to do is spend time digging into that. But here's the two main points we need to know. The time when the power of darkness reigns is introduced here. Jesus is basically saying, at the end of it, he says, this is the time where the enemy is going to get to have his way for a short number of, like, what do you want to say here, about nine hours. And then he thought he had experienced victory, but then just a couple days later, darkness no longer reigns. But Jesus says, basically, this event really ushers in when Satan was at his most active. His, uh, Satan was full of pride and joy of what was going on to Jesus. He thought that he was tearing down God. He was getting victory. I mean, this was a time where, where darkness thought it was winning. And at the same time, while Jesus says, darkness, this is your time to have your way, there was not a second of time from this point till Jesus' resurrection where God was not one thousand percent in control of every single thing that happened god didn't lose control during this period of time it, god was sovereign this was his will he knew what was happening and jesus was in full submission to his father and we're going to see he goes you know i could do this but i'm not i could do this but I'm not because I'm going to follow my father. And Jesus was in full control, even when he's getting betrayed. And it's an amazing story. It's beautiful to see. And it just encourages me even more to know that Jesus, even in his worst time, had 100% authority, yet followed his father without a fail. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the order of events comes this, all right? Basically, you had Jesus just ending his prayer time. And we studied that the last two weeks, talking about how Jesus spent time and how he began his prayer time weak in the body, weak in, you know, needing to be lifted up. He was asking God, Lord, if there's any way that this could be taken off of me, please let it be so. And he struggled with that. But as he went back and he spent time prayer with his father three separate times, you could see his resolve and his strength and the power and the God answering his prayers and giving him strength, giving him fortitude, allowing him to have all of the conviction he needed to face this time. And he had just got done talking to his disciples going, man, you guys just keep sleeping. Oh, never mind. It's too late. Get up because... Behold, my betrayer comes. And that's just right after the time that he had gotten full of God's conviction. Now Judas <coughs> approaches the temple with temple guards and Roman soldiers. Think about this. Romans and Jews did not cooperate on anything. 
the Roman, the, 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 the temple guards and the Sanhedrin and the Jewish relief, they hated Rome. And there was never a time that you saw anything <coughs> where the two of them were cooperating together. You know, Roman guards might do something and the Jewish were doing other things, but you had never seen them come into unison until here. This is the first time where basically the Roman gu or the uh, temple guards were going out. They were the ones doing the arresting. The Roman guys were just there with their swords bringing a show of force. Basically, they're walking, but they were together, and they were unified in purpose for the first time in the history of the Bible recorded that they were unified in going to get Jesus. And it's an amazing thing when you really look at this picture because it describes that it says, and as Jesus said these words, this is from Matthew, <coughs> Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. Now, Going across here. Got to go to John, John chapter 18. He says, The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany them, now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons. They arrived at the olive grove. See, three of the gospels only just recorded a crowd. John says, No, nah, we need this detail of what that crowd consisted of and what they looked like. You got a bunch of temple guards with authority. You got Roman soldiers with authority, with, I think, so, an extra little bit of rabble around him, all coming to get Jesus carrying, carrying torches, carrying lanterns, and carrying swords. I mean, this was not a safe crowd to be hanging around and seeing. This was a, a concerning event coming down upon the disciples. So get that picture and make sure you see that. And when you know, the next thing that happens, we'll go into more details on Judas's greeting and kiss, Jesus's response. Jesus commands the guards to let his disciples go. Peter turns and goes violent. Jesus reinstates calm, and then Jesus yields to God's will and fulfills prophecy. Those are all of the steps when you really look at this. And if you read each one of the Gospels independently, you lose all of the, the big picture here. So, so when you put it all together, this is what happens. Bryce, go and go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> go. Nope, one more. There we go. All right. So what I did is I already I kind of covered here the, the the crowd, temple guards and Roman soldiers in unity. Question exclamation mark question mark. Exclamation. This is an amazing thing to kind of grasp from this picture. But this is the next part that really blew my mind. <clears throat> when Judas went to Jesus, he gives a greeting, and it's captured in Matthew, where it says, Greetings, Rabbi. See, some of the other ones don't capture both words, but in Matthew, it says, Greetings, Rabbi. He's given this kind of a cheerful thing. But when he used, he used a really interesting word when Judas said this to Jesus. He used the word kairo, which means to be cheerful. Be cheerful. Calmly happy. It was a very specific greeting that he gave that had an edge to it. The other time that this word was used was when Gabriel came down to Mary and says, Greetings, favored woman. See, he's kind of telling Mary, you know, she sees an angel coming down, and she, he's kind of like giving this greeting to Mary, be calm. <laughs> you, you, you know, I know you're going to freak out because I'm here, but you need to be calm, be happy. I've got a good news thing coming. That's how, that's how Gabriel used the word. Here comes Judas using that same word to Jesus as he's getting ready to betray him. Kind of like, greetings, be calm. You know, there was just kind of the sarcasm into it. It's a binding word. It's not a, it's not a polite greeting. It's kind of like almost like Jesus was just doing a little bit of a needle into Jesus. If you, Judas was doing that. That's what it seemed to me, doesn't it? It was a very, very specific greeting. Cheerful. Hey, Jesus. Hey, Rabbi. Greetings. Be calm. You, yeah, you see the crowd behind me. Just don't make a scene. Be calm, Jesus. And yet, and, and, and what's amazing, yeah, you know, I've read one book, I'm going to say this. I actually read a, a fiction book that, that tried to repaint Judas 
like the rest of the world always does, into a, into a new light. They said, well, he was just a misguided disciple who wanted to see Jesus come into his own. And so all he did was just try to facilitate Jesus becoming and, and, and taking that, that position that Judas wanted him to see. <clears throat> and what was dangerous about this book <clears throat> was it almost gave you a little bit of, you, you almost started to feel sorry for Judas in a certain way. Because like you say, you start to see him as the misunderstood, misunderstood disciple. He really wasn't that bad. No, Judas is every bit the villain that we make him out to be. He was and is the man who betrayed his Savior, his Lord, and never repented from it, never felt remorse about it. And like I said, when you look at the details, like this right here, this is Judas being a smart tail. Okay? Jesus, you know, he was going in there and going, greetings, Rabbi, and you know, He's got the crowd behind him. He could see the smirk of arrogance almost is on his face. <clears throat> and what's amazing is the three responses that Jesus gives him. Now, the first of it is in Matthew 26, 50. Jesus, says, Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you've come for. Now, if you don't know what the word friend here is, sometimes you're thinking, oh, Jesus is such a forgiving guy. He calls Judas his friend. I'm going to say that when you look and you study that word, friend, the word, you know, so Jesus got this little needle back. Guess what? Jesus, he's quick on his feet. And he's able to turn it around because the use, the word that Jesus used for friend here was this. Um, I didn't record the details. Go to the next slide, Bryson. <clears throat> okay. He used the word friend. It was also used two other times in the, in the Gospels. Let me go ahead and give you the other examples of when this word friend was used. It's in Matthew 20, verse 13. And this is about the, you know, he, uh, the workers went out into the field and they all got paid the same. And they, you know, one worked for the same price all day for the same one that came out like in the, in the afternoon. They all got paid the same price. One of the guys came up and complained to the guy and said, hey, why am I getting paid the same as everybody else? His response was, friend, I'm, I'm, I'm doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me? You know, did you not agree to work for me for a denarius? Basically, it was just kind of like, was he really a friend, this, this worker, and to this guy? No, it, it, there was no personal relationship here. It was just a kind of a, an acquaintance type of relation. Hey, friend, you, you're a guy I don't really know, but I'm going to call you, you know, use this word friend. The other time was used when it says, friend, how, do you, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? This was in Matthew 22, where everybody was invited to the wedding, and yet he came in, and the guy was not wearing the wedding clothes, and typically they were given to him, and you know, so that he was greeted with the word friend. Where are your? Why aren't you dressed? See, this isn't a relationship here. This is an acquaintance. This is somebody that was barely known. So Jesus, knowing Judas, he goes, friend, guy who I don't even really know anymore. I don't know who you are. He's, he referred to him as friend. Now, if you just go back a couple of scripture verses previously, Jesus says, I now call all his disciples who are with him. You are no longer slaves. I'm no longer master, but we are what? Friends. When Jesus used that word, he said, Filios. This was the brotherly love. This was true friendship that he said to his disciples, you are now my friends. But to Judas, he goes, friend, guy I barely know, go ahead and do what you came to do. So Jesus kind of gave it back to Judas going, you know, you're not my friend, really. Because he could have been, Judas could have been a deep friend, but he chose opposite. And so Jesus kind of gave him, Judas, you're, you're not my friend. You're, you're, you're just barely a guy I barely know. Go ahead and do what you came to do. Jesus used a word that kind of had to take Judas and go, oh, you know, greetings, Rabbi. Jesus replies, person I barely know, go ahead. There, there, there's, you can see the pain. You can see that interaction. Do you see? Do you feel the tension? And do you see it a little bit differently than I did before? Because I always thought when he, Jesus was being, friend, you know, I love you. I'm going to forgive you. you. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. No, that's not what Jesus was trying to portray at all. And I think it's important for us to capture that he was hurt. And he made sure that the point was made. So my friend, go ahead and do what you come to do, come for, Matthew 26, 50. But then the other response Jesus gave was, Judas, 
Did you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, this kiss wasn't a compassionate kiss. If you've ever been over to the Middle East, when I lived in Turkey, I met plenty of guys, and you gave each other the, you know, the, the cheek kiss, you know, kind of this uh, mwah, mwah thing. That's, that's standard. That's like a shake of the hand. Um, you know, so when Jesus, Judas says, I'm going to betray, you know, this is the signal that I'm going to go up and, and greet or kiss the, the guy who you're going to arrest, it's just him going up and saying hi in the, in, in the Middle Eastern way. Um, I think there's some times where we take that kiss a little bit deeper sometimes. It's still a painful thing, right? It's still an act of betrayal. It's still, when you go up and you greet somebody that way, you're saying, hey, you're my friend. Even after Jesus says, friend, I don't know, Judas came up and still gave him the kiss to the side of the cheek as the symbol. And Jesus, Judas, Jesus going, Judas, would you, seriously, man, you're going to betray me? By acting like you actually love me and care for me, like we're friends. Well, are you really going to do this? Sorrow there. Jesus was indeed betrayed. It would hurt him deeply. And those words had to sting deep. Had to sting real deep. But after this, Jesus reinserts. You know, he's been betrayed but then the Gospel of John records another very interesting uh, statement. Basically, it says this. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen. This is John 18, verse 4. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for? He asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. He says, I told you, I am he. Now, the word that is, I am he, if you look in various versions of the Bible, and even in some of them, they'll have all of these it's basically stated in this way. I am, in the big capital letters, he. Now, if you remember the I am, that goes back to Exodus, where God introduced himself to Moses. and says, I am who I am, basically saying, I am everything. I am. Who are you? I am. Where'd you come from? I am. And so that infers pure godhood. And so Jesus, you know, I love how it says, I am he. Kind of gives the God man connotation to it because the he's lowercase but then it says you know that there's other ways you can do it it says i am he capital h going i am god i am you know once again referring to the godhead they're saying you know the other ways that this could have been written was hey the i am is here you know the i am the god i am god i am here right here or, I am the Lord, which would be referring in, into the Jewish word of Yahweh. I am God. In any case, any way you rephrase these things. But I love the variety because it puts an emphasis on the different character of who Jesus is. He is God. He's man. He's the God man. He is God. You know, they're all the unity. It just brings, when he said that statement, man, he was saying, I am, and almost like a plus. You know, I am he, I am God, I am with, you know, and it's just, when he said that, he was stating I am. And the power of those words, even to Judas himself, caused all of the Roman guards, all of the temple, temple guards who were there, and Judas himself all got knocked back on their feet, hitting the ground. Hitting the ground, like, I, mean, I think it was all the way down. When he said who he was, they were like bowing down because they knew. And they, it, it, but I don't know if they did it with purpose. You know, would, were, they, were they aware that when they got knocked backwards, were they doing it out of an act of reverence? Or was this a, what kind of a, a preview of what it's going to look like in heaven when every knee's going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Was this just one of those moments where Jesus' authority knocked them all back, showing what it's going to look like in heaven, that no matter who and what people's relationship is Jesus, they're all going to get knocked back on our feet, including us, 
Now, we're not going to be hitting our knees. Sadly, we're going to be hitting our knees going, yes, this is my Lord. I'm praising you. We're going to be all. But then there's going to be a lot of people like Judas and all of these guys who were depra- you know, betrayed Jesus all their life. They, too, are going to be knocked back on their feet. And, and so regardless if it was this overcoming awe of who Jesus was that caused them to bow down, I still love the picture of this pure authority. In the midst of being betrayed and right before being arrested, Jesus goes, I am. And those guards and those soldiers and Judas himself knew that if there was anything that was going to happen after this point, it wasn't by their strength. It was because Jesus was going to let them. I think any idea of them actually having power over Jesus left those guys right at that moment when they encountered. And they all of a sudden knew, wow, this guy's awesome. They still did their job. And the last thing that Jesus does in response, right after he says, I am he, he says to the guys, all to the guards, don't arrest any of my disciples. Let my disciples go. It's one of the last things were on his mind. Don't don't arrest these guys who are with me. And what's amazing, Jesus said that before Peter cut off the ear. This was before Peter drew out the sword. Jesus gave this command, hey, you're going to let my guys go. Peter ought to be in jail, right? I mean, he had a Roman soldiers and temple guards, and Peter stabs and cuts off the ear. Why was Peter not sent to jail? Because Jesus says, you weren't going to take them in. He had authority. He says, you're, you're not going to arrest any of my guys. Because he had the authority like that. That's, just, that's an amazing picture to see that Jesus going, you're going to make sure my guys are going to go free. I'm coming with you, but they are not. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Bryson. So then, so right after Jesus commands, don't arrest my guys, all of the guards and everybody, they now step forward. After being knocked back on their feet with the authority of Jesus, Jesus somehow gives them the nod that they can now take him into custody. I don't know what was said because they just got knocked back, but now they come forward and they grab Jesus. And as soon as they grab Jesus, all of the disciples are going, wait wait a minute. Is this the time? Are we now clear in Luke, I believe it says? Yes, it is. Right here, Luke 22, 49 says, when the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. So the disciples are like, is this the time where we get to fight? And they all ask Jesus. He doesn't respond because Peter just goes off on his own, pulls out the sword, and attacks. Now, for us who've watched The Chosen, it's interesting that it's Peter that does the attack and not Simon the Zealot. You'd think if there was going to be a dude who would pull out the sword and do the attack, and it would have been the zealot trained in killing Romans and in and, and warfare. I mean, Simon the zealot was the guy who should have gone out with that sword going, it's about time. <laughs> He'd been waiting for it. But, see, I think it's a testimony to Simon the zealot that he didn't. He didn't attack. He waited for Jesus to give him the go. I think he was fully ready to attack. But he didn't. You know, this was a guy trained to revolt and to attack and to hate the Romans. And this was the time. And yet he still reserved himself enough to honor and listen to Jesus' words. Where good old Peter uh-uh, pulls out that sword and goes at it. Now, the Roman sword, the swords that they had are made to stab. They weren't really made to slash. This wasn't the way they were designed and made. And so you, I, this, I read this, and nobody knows exactly what Peter did, but it makes sense, big, given the weapon that he had, that Peter wasn't trying to slash and do something to hurt somebody. He was going for a headshot. He was, and so somehow that, that the, the priest, the, the, the slave of the priest, had just kind of was able to dodge Peter's attack, and that's what took off his ear. But I want you to see this picture of Peter going for a kill. He was, you know, he wasn't just trying to to maim somebody. He was going for the attack to kill this guy because this was, he was going to defend his Jesus. We all know Peter and his impulsiveness. 
That's what he wants to do. Let me at him. Let me go. Let's go. Let's go. And, and so here's Peter. Takes out that sword. Takes off the ear of Malchus. What did Jesus do in respond, though? In response to this person? He goes, and here's his word. Let me let him speak for himself. In Luke, he records Jesus saying, no more of this. So here's his point. This was on the razor's edge. You've got all the, the Roman soldiers. They're probably grabbing for their swords, getting ready to go to town. Because, you know, they didn't suffer anybody attacking one of it. You know, maybe it was because it was the priest's servant's ear. But if it had been a centurion that had gotten stabbed, that might have, <laughs> that could have been an ugly. But I'm sure the, the, the centurion, everybody around, all the Roman soldiers are getting ready to go, okay. We're going to have to do it this way. And, but if Jesus, once again, goes, ah, no more of this. Just stops everybody cold. Here's this. I can see the Romans. I can see the, the, I don't know if the guards, the temple guards had weapons or not, but I can see everybody getting ready to go to, here we go. And Jesus says, no more of this. He stops it cold before it could go any further. So he stops the violence. That's who our Lord is. He doesn't, he doesn't need violence. He doesn't want violence. He stops violence. And I think that's an important characteristic that we ought to know in our own heart when we have violence come up in us. Not that we're going to go out and stab somebody, but cutting them off in traffic or using words or, you know, all of the ways that we use violence today that's, that's just as harmful and hurtful sometimes we need to watch ourselves. Jesus stops the violence. In the midst of this, somehow, some way, Jesus is still free enough to say, he goes up and he heals the guy that was hurt because of the violence. Now, amongst all the things that are going on, Jesus is still concerned about healing somebody who was injured. What that must have looked like and how that happened was an amazing thing. You know, as I, the Passion of the Christ has a really cool kind of scene about how that worked. He just picked up the ear, put it back on, and, and the awe of the priest's uh, servant at being and, and healed like that. I, I love that picture from that movie because that is a powerful picture of Jesus. Even in the midst of betrayal and being arrested, he goes, yeah, let, me, let me go ahead and heal you first before, before we go on to this. Jesus heals. And what the last thing Jesus says, though, is that he reminds everybody that he's not a victim here. He's not a victim. In Matthew's account, Jesus reminds Peter and everyone else there that he could call upon legions of angels. That's tens of thousands of angels. He goes, Peter, I could call out 10,000 angels to come here right now if I wanted to. I'm no victim. Stop this because this is the Father's will. He says he could call down legion, but then he adds, but if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? See, once again, Jesus goes, I know what I got to do. I know what God has preordained for me. I know what's been said about this. How can I call down those angels and mess up my Father's will? How can I interject and bring us? Yeah, come on, how cool would it have been for Jesus to say, angels, come down, and it would have been awesome. I would have still loved Jesus just as much from that response. I think that would have been a cool response. You know, to see him bring down those angels, get freed, and, and whatever else, however they would. But no, he says, no, I'm not going to use that power. That's something we're going to yet see. He kind of held that in reserve. We still get to see that in the future. He didn't ruin that. There's going to be a time where Jesus is going to come back with legions of angels and us coming back for his church when he comes for that second coming. Amen. We're not going to only see the angels. We're going to be part of that army coming back down when Jesus comes back in his second coming. That's a beautiful picture. Isn't that going to be amazing? I don't know how you're going to see it. I don't know how. I, I, I want to see Jesus on that horse while I'm up there. And, and I just want to see the majesty of my Lord coming back to this earth to take his reign. What a beautiful day it's going to be. So I'm glad he saved that. He saved that beauty. And he says, no, I need, we've got to let the scriptures be fulfilled. 
John records it this way. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? And then Jesus at the end even asked the, temp, you know, the temple guards and the soldiers about the timing and motivation. You know, he goes, you know, I have been out. You didn't have to come here tonight. Am I some dangerous revolutionary seek, plotting in secret, hiding in a cave, getting ready to overthrow? You've heard my words. And this is what he says basically in all the scriptures. Say, you know, hey, I've been preaching at your temple for six days in a row now. You could have gotten me over there every time. Why are you doing it now in secret? Why, you know, he kind of gives these guys, he, he points out the shamness of this and, the, and, the, and the, the dirtiness of the trial. That they're coming at midnight, in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere to arrest him. Rather than to be so bold and do it right in front of the people where he was saying everything that they were. Because Jesus basically goes, this, I'm not a victim here. This is all because this has been pre-written, pre-ordained. My Father's in control. I am yielding to Him. I could stop it if I want to, but I'm not. I'm going to go through with it. But I love that picture with the violence, though. Jesus, Peter goes to attack. Jesus' response, stop the violence, heals the injured, and says, knock this thing off. I'm doing my Father's will. We don't need to go violent to do this. Okay, next slide. And all throughout this, Jesus is concerned about keeping God's word. There are so many prophecies written about what Jesus was going to go through. You have Isaiah 53 that talks about the suffering servant, right? And that just describes Jesus' life and the, and the pain and the anguish and the betrayal that he's going to go through and every step of the way. And Jesus goes, hey, how can I stop what God has said is going to happen? He's written about this in years past. This is his will still, and I'm going to make sure that God's word is proven true. He was concerned about prophecy. He was concerned about his father's word is what Jesus was. He goes, I want to make sure my father, you know, they're not going to be able to say, well, but Isaiah 53 said you, this was going to happen, but it didn't, so we can't trust God's word. No, he's like, no, you're not going to be able to do that. Everything that is said in the Bible is true, and it is trustworthy. Watch this. And he made sure it was. In John 17, 12, he even told his disciples earlier that night, I'm not going to lose a single one of you except for one who's preordained. He, and so he was concerned about keeping a word that he spoke over his own disciples when he says, don't arrest these guys. He was keeping his own prophecy that he had said and recorded earlier that I'm not going to lose any of you. God, nobody's going to take these guys from my hand except for the one, Judas, who's predestined for destruction. And then good old Zechariah 13, 7, you know, it says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. Jesus knew that this was said. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He knew that the result of his not calling down the angels, he knew by not allowing Peter and Simon and everybody else to go to town and, and, you know, and go, you know, do the violence and fight off the Romans and start a revolution. He knew that what was going to happen at the end of this was everybody that he was protecting and defending and called his friend, his true friend, were going to scatter and abandon and leave. And that he was going to be left alone to face what was coming up. In the, in, in the hours to come. And that's what's recorded at the end of <clears throat> at the end of almost every one of them it says, but for all of this is happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Right when Jesus says, I'm going to allow the prophecies about me to come true. His disciples said, well, I guess I'm not sticking around. They booked because they said, well, now where's our hope? He's not going to overthrow the government. He's not going to do what all of these expectations that they had placed upon Jesus. And so well, let's get out of here before we get arrested too, before something else bad happens. Before, And so they took off. Good old Mark. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. One young man fallen behind was clothed only in a long linen shirt. When the mob tried to grab him, 
he slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. And now the soldiers were going to rebay, and they were going to leave Jesus alone, but the mob that was around Jesus, they were getting bloodthirsty. You could already see the bloodthirstiness of the mob around the Jewish temple guards and the, and the Romans about their anger, angst, and they had a new target to put all of their rage upon, and that was Jesus and anybody associated with them. So you could see that tension. And so they were booking out of there, not you know, for their own lives, not just only abandoning Jesus, but also to, to save themselves. And so Jesus, go ahead and go to the next slide. When you look at the story from top to bottom, and you take all of the gospel narrative and you put them into one big picture, was Jesus ever one moment out of control? Was, was the circumstances that Jesus was going under out of his control? No. He knew that he could at any moment have his will done and have his father respond and that he could, you know, all, every single thing that happened to him was not something that happened to him, but because he allowed it to be. And I think that's important to know. Jesus thought it was most important to let God allow things to happen to him as God wanted it to be rather than Jesus being acted upon. It's important in a world that wants to be a victim all the time that we recognize that our Savior was never once a victim of circumstances. He was always an obedient follower of his Father's will. And it made him look like a victim. We play it off. He, he, was, he was murdered completely and totally without cause. If there's one person in the history of history that could call himself a victim of circumstances, it's Jesus. But that's not our Savior. He goes, no, I'm just obedient. And no, I don't want to go through this, but I'm going to because I trust my Father and I know this is for the good of all of everybody. So even what looks like a chaotic moment, God and Jesus in his Father's will was fully in control. And that means even today, as the virus goes out of control, out of, you know, we see Afghanistan disintegrate, we see our government just seemingly ready to topple, we see you know, all of these warning signs and all of the chaos swirling around us and the violence in the street and this, you know, all of the things <coughs> that we rail upon and say, oh, these things are so horrible and I, you know, I wish that we could change them. God is still 110% in control of what is going on around us. Oh, it's chaos to be certain. But it's not chaos we have to worry about because he, as long as we keep seeking his will and make sure that we're, we're trying to abide in him the best we can, even in the most chaotic circumstances, just like Jesus, even in the midst of being betrayed and arrested, he was in control of who and everything about him. And we're supposed to be like him. Not like Peter. Not like the rest of the disciples. We're supposed to be like Jesus. In the midst of chaos, we are unmovable. We are for certain. Our faith is clear. Our belief is, t is, 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 is firm. Our trust is unshakable in Jesus. No matter what's going on around us. I think it's easy to say violence is never in Jesus' will. He doesn't like violence. He says to be prepared, but he doesn't ever want us to go to violence. And even when it looks like the world is winning, it isn't. I didn't, I didn't say it ain't. I wanted that word instead. The world ain't winning. Uh-uh. Even when it looks like it, no, our God is in control. Still and always. So even during the worst part of Jesus' life, he's still modeling beauty and trust and things that we can put our faith and hope and trust in without shaking anything. He's once again our perfect Savior, our perfect King, our perfect Lord, and he is worthy of 
all of the worship we gave him this morning. He's worthy of every adoration that we have for him right now. And he's worthy of every submission that we're going to give to obedience. Because it's not obedience in the, in the fact that we don't, we're giving up everything. We're just giving up everything because we know he is perfect. And everything about that, in every future decision that we yield to him, <coughs> always seek God's will, always abide in God and find that strength. Because Jesus spent that time in prayer, and this is the kind of strength that his Father will give him, and this is the kind of strength that he'll give us through every one of our trials and tribulations. If we seek him, we will receive the strength just like Jesus did to be able to handle anything that the world comes our way. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for even in the midst of one of your darkest times, being betrayed by a disciple and being handed over to ungodly people, you still demonstrated that you were in control because you were in submission to your Father and you knew your Father's will and that's what you were accomplishing and that made everything good. Everything was good and would be turn out perfect because you knew you were in the center of what, your, what our Father wanted. Well, now, Lord, I pray that you reveal to us your will in such a way that we are able to also be so obedient, so seeking, so desirous that we want to do your will because we know your way is perfect. And whenever I get involved, I mess it up. God, keep, me out, keep my plans out of things because your ways will lead to peace, joy, happiness, kindness, goodness, all of the fruits of the Spirit come through our willingness to follow in you. Even though times may look dark, even though things may look like they're out of control and we might have to go through a season of pain, just as Jesus did, you rose him from the grave into a better state than he ever existed, being on earth, to put him by your right hand to God the Father Almighty. Even through the worst of times, you still brought him out in a better place. Well, God, I trust. I trust, I trust, I trust that, Lord, you will bring me out in a better place, that you will bring my family through any difficulty into a better place, that you will bring this church from a season of, of challenge into a better place because, Lord, always when we seek your will, that the income, the outcome is always better than what we started. <laughs> and I have this faith in you. I put this trust in you. And Lord, I ask that you give me the strength this week to act and to seek and to follow you and to model you and to be just a little bit more like you. Because Jesus, you are our Lord. You are my Savior. You are my all in all. And I just want to be like you and be with you. In Jesus' name.